Friends, this is Paquito de Rivera. Welcome to another chapter of the Pac-Man's Corner. This time we are celebrating the jazz French horn. Not very common, the use of the French horn in jazz. And we have three very special great hornists in our show. John Clark, David Amram, and Chris Comer, principal hornist of the New Jersey Symphony, for whom recently I wrote a piece for French horn, jazz trio, and symphony orchestra, the New Jersey Symphony. <laughs> People like Julius Watkins, probably Julius mm. was one of the, if not the first, with Julius Watkins, Gunther Schuller, 
eh, eh, Tony Miranda. Did you ever met that guy, Tony Miranda? Oh yeah, yeah, you sure. Know? I know, I knew Tony. I have to tell you, there's a couple of names that you might not know about. One name is Junior Collins. Now, Junior was also around the same era as Julius, and uh, Junior Collins played on a few jazz records, and he was an improviser. He was a real honest to goodness jazz uh, musician, but he didn't get to record very much, and then he passed away before he could really uh, get famous. Okay, but that's, some, that's someone, it would be great to do some research and try to find some recordings of his, what, but what uh, is, I never what, have been able to. What is now, his name? Now, the other name, what oh, is the, the name, name is Junior Collins. Junior Collins, ah, I never heard of that. that maybe there is some recordings around, no? There are some recordings, mm -hmm. yep. Um, and the other name, uh, who also was from that era and who is still alive now is Willie Ruff. Ruff? You know about Willie Ruff? No, Ruff. R-U-F-F. -F. Ah, Willie Ruff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good to know that because it's a, it's a hidden story there, you know. Very few uh, uh, jazz French horn players that they don't uh, it's very interesting because some of them, then, uh, they, they really can't swing. <laughs> you, for example, <laughs> I, I yeah. remember when I, I saw you playing that instrument, playing with that. Uh, did you play another instrument before the French horn? Piano was my first instrument. Very good for you. Then trumpet. Then guitar. Then horn. And, uh, and bass, electric bass. Actually, I, lately I've been playing electric bass a lot, and uh, but I'm still playing the horn all the time. So um, whenever I uh, whenever I have students or I do a master class or something, I tell them, you know, playing other instruments is really really healthy and good for you. Piano especially. Yeah. You know that's something dizzy. You, the the dizzy piano. Dizzy would always tell you, play the piano, play the piano, play the piano. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I remember that I, I was reading in a in a interview in Downbeat that there was a student asking uh, Miles David, "What should I do to improve my trumpet playing?" And Miles said, "Get yourself a piano." Ah, <laughs> <laughs> that, I never that, heard that, but yeah, 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 it's good. Get yourself a piano. Yeah. Uh, it, the, the knowledge yeah. of the piano is so important, but there is something interesting about the the uh, articulation and all that uh, uh, way of mm. swinging way that you have to play your jazz French horn. Some of, of these uh, other French horn jazz players, they start with the trumpet. One of them is Julius Watkins. The other one was Chris Comer. And the other was David Damron. Yep. Well, oh, yeah. Yep. I have David. I have crazy David Damron. What is well, your first instrument? What the horn is like? No, I played the trumpet in a jazz band before. I said, now we can oh, see yeah, that, yeah. that trumpet, yeah. that Clifford Brownish way to play the French horn, you know. <laughs> so it's interesting that you play also the exactly. trumpet before you play the. Uh, Yep. The horn. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to show you this other instrument I have. I invented this instrument myself. I know. The horn. In a way, I kind of missed. Yeah, you saw it already? No. Wait, I let me know. show it to you. I, I, I can't wait to see it. That's it right there. Ah. And, and those. Uh, ah, look oh. at that. And the mouthpiece is uh, it's a horn, French horn mouthpiece. Ooh. Yep, same mouthpiece. Same mouthpiece and cylinders or, or, or valves? <laughs> in what key? Is it an F? Yeah, it's got, yeah, it's an F and it's got piston valves like a trumpet. Huh? Whereas, actually, this is an F and B flat. So you can change it with this here in the B flat. Okay. Wow. So that's my little advertisement for the hornet. 
Well, so so the still they produce it? No, no. That one is just a prototype that I had made. And uh, I've been trying for about 30 years to get someone to produce it. No luck. Oh. Not yet, anyway. That instrument yeah. can be very popular. It, it's, it's something similar they have with, with the mellophone, but they say that was totally out of tune. Totally out of tune and really big and really hard to manage. But, yeah, but this, okay. I think, you know, like for, for big band or, or any kind of loud situation where you need to uh, project your sound, this instrument would really work. Uh, it, of course, it looks, that little plastic one of yours is pretty nice too. Yeah, it looks very interesting instrument, you know. <laughs> and, and the yeah. name is uh, the Hornet. This is like great. Yep. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I hope that you can put that in, in, in production because it looks like it's something that can be very successful. I you think so too. Very yeah. good. So that is the only one that, that ex isn't yeah. existed, right? Exactly. So you still play around in some like, with jazz gigs? You play that instrument in the jazz gigs, right? I have, yeah. In fact, I did some recordings with that. I played, uh, when I was playing in McCoy Tyner's big band, I would sometimes would use that, use the hornet. And also with Gil Evans, and so I played it on some recordings, but uh, not for not since a few years. Oh, you know that another horn player that I remember, but he disappeared from here. Was Peter Gordon? Remember that guy? He he got a group called the French Toast with Michel. Yes, Camilo. I remember that. Michel Camilo played yes. the piano. I remember that. French, that, that's, that's, uh, I remember that. I remember really well. Yeah. Sammy it, Figueroa played percussion with them. Sammy Figueroa, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> Sammy Figueroa. Yeah, and Anthony Jackson, Anthony on bass, and Dave Weckel on drums. That was a fantastic rhythm oh. section. I, right? I, saw, I saw them very often in a play, wonderful place called Mikel's. Remember that place? I sure do. 96. That's right around the corner from where I live. Ah, oh, you live around there? Yeah, but now you know what's there? Whole Foods. Yeah, it's a pity because it was a wonderful place. A, a little odd, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the stage was in a, in a bit of, very, very odd position, you know, in the way to the bathroom or something. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. It was like a very long, very long, narrow place. <laughs> yeah, Mikel was a very, very pretty blonde lady, was the, the owner of the, of the place. Uh, but yep. called, Pat Mikel was the name. Uh, you, you forgot, yeah, one, yeah. you forgot one, one musician in that band was Lou Soloff was playing trumpet there too. Yep, Lou Soloff and uh, Lou Marini on saxophone, Ooh, I think. Lou, Lou Marini, Marini. yeah. Well, that is the group where Michel Camilo took his first trio. A Anthony Jackson, uh -huh. Anthony oh, Jackson, Dave Weckl, right, and uh, and Michel yeah, Camilo yeah, yeah. trio, and Sammy once in a while, Sammy to play percussion yeah. and make and make the practical jokes, <laughs> <laughs> and do imitations of everybody. Yeah, especially. Oh, what a funny cat! Oh, fantastic. Do, doing the impersonation of, of Sammy Davis. What's up, babe? <laughs> oh my God! Yeah. So, yeah. so John, what are you doing these days? Are you are you well apart from the uh, aside from from the pandemic and all that? But are you doing ma mainly freelancing or what? Actually, Paquito, I'm writing a lot. Uh, actually, right <laughs> now because there's there's a lot of a lot of time for a composition, and. Uh, I got associated with a couple of different groups in the city. One is called Composers Concordance. Uh, maybe you heard of it. No. Um, there's these two guys that run it. One is a guitar player and a rapper by the name of Gene Pritzker. The other guy is a bass player uh, by the name of uh, Dan. Uh, oh, geez, it's escaping me now. I'll think of his name in a sec. But anyway, this is the type of group where a bunch of composers get together 
and uh, they everybody writes something and then you play everybody else's stuff. So if I write something, I take it in, it, they play it, and then I have to play on everybody else's stuff too. So it's a really great uh, situation for just inspiring you to compose more and to compose for different uh, instrumentation. So you you have, you have a, a a rhythm section or something, or is it it's a group of instrumentalists too? Or what? It just it all depends on who shows up that day. So sometimes it could be a rhythm section, and it's you know it's uh, like what you a lot of it sounds maybe like contemporary classical music. Some of it is straight ahead jazz. Some of it is hip hop. Could be all different kind of things. That that is fantastic because uh, for what I can understand, you you do different type of music, and you don't have to, yeah. have to you don't have to limit yourself to one specific type of music like th these groups of, of uh, classical so called classical composers they they are sometimes very limited to one type of music the same with the jazz composers once in a while they are a, a little limited yeah. with, with with a group like that right. you can you can uh, you can play any type of music from cuban music to to contemporary stuff anything isn't that great? And, and you and you play exactly. You play once in a while uh, in some places. You perform with the group. Yeah, sure, sure. Whenever, uh, as soon as the virus goes away, we'll be playing all over. Oh my God! I hope this is over soon. And, and well, the, yeah, really. The, the, this pandemic, the, the only thing, the only advantage that that has is that I ha I got the chance to to see you again after so many years. Uh, and, and talk about yes, your, your, yes. your hornet, and uh, you are doing well. And uh, I have the opportunity yep. to tell you that you you have been one of my favorite uh, uh, colleagues in the studio, and and oh, you with your horn. And uh, I thank you very much to be wow. part of this show, and hope to play some music together very soon. We love you, man. Okay, igualmente. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, John Clark, the, the great John Clark. Thank Jazz you. Jazz horn player. Thank Ready you, Paquito. Bye-bye. Jazz horn player, how come? Well, I was 15 years old <clears throat> and I was playing with the symphony and I had spent a good part of my life loving jazz. I started off playing the trumpet till I was about 13. Oh. And I started in Washington, D.C. A wonderful trombone player named Dick Lee said, man, come on and play with that Dixieland band. I said, what, what do I do? He said, you just hear it and you play it. I was petrified. So I was about, he said, I'll, you'll, you don't know when to take a solo. You'll take a solo after me. I was scared. So it was t time for Dick Leet's solo. I said, uh-oh. I was shaking. And he wasn't there. I said, man, where is he? It's time for his solo. I heard him solo. He was making a phone call. He opened up the booth, the door of the telephone call, put down the receiver, and played a fantastic solo. Then it was my turn. He pointed to me and he closed the door and went back to his phone call. I was so <laughs> amazed. I forgot how frightened I was. And I vaguely got through it. And they said, man, that was great. So that was my beginning. And I mentioned that only because I was lucky to be with people who were supportive. And then I realized, of course, there's no such thing as a jazz instrument. If it weren't for Sidney Bechet, we wouldn't even think of the soprano saxophone as a jazz instrument or might not think of it at all. 
And when Buddy Bolden and then Louis Armstrong and all the other trumpet players, I spent the whole day mentioning great players of the past and the young cats now who are terrifying. There was The trumpet was not a jazz instrument. Adolf Sax invented the saxophone, I think 1875, as a band instrument. And Dode, the uh, La Fortune Dode, the great Barlesian suite, was written by Bizet. That was used the saxophone, and then Glazunov and all the wonderful Russian composers used it. But it wasn't until people took the saxophone and made it a voice for their performing of what they created that it became a jazz instrument. And now the violin certainly didn't. St so there's no such thing as a jazz instrument. There are people who play jazz on different instruments, and some of us stumble and fumble our way into it. In 1951, Dizzy and his whole band crashed at my place, and he said, man, you got to hear, when you come to New York, they said, you sound all right. You got to hear Julius Watkins. I said, oh, I've heard of him. And then, of course, I heard that amazing record that he made with Monk. And we played totally different from one another because there was no person we were supposed to copy. And sure. when I used to go and play in Harlem and all over the States and in Europe when I was in the army to say, here, here comes Frenchy, because I had my French horn. <laughs> it was considered to be sort of like a freak carried this big snail case. So I was very fortunate that I just started off from scratch and I recorded with Oscar Pettiford and Kenny Durham and Hampton Hawes and Pepper and then had my own group. But Julius and I finally got together and it was just so beautiful and so much fun to play. He was such a remarkable person and a great player. And we had completely different ways of playing. And it was just a big thrill. And now I go to these horn conventions and they actually wrote out the solos that Julius and I played in 1956. And they had all these horn players playing Oscar Pettiford's arrangements. And I said, man, I think I go back to composing <laughs> or stay with it. And now I don't have to be the pioneer because there's so many horn players doing it. So I wrote that blues for Monk. I wrote the perfect solo that I could never play because I had 224 chances to fix it up. And I, we have to remember, Paquito, you're the last guy in the world, I have to tell, but you're, for your listeners, if they want to be like like you, and we all do, then you have to practice, you have to listen, you have to be humble, and you have to hang out and realize every person has a story, everyone has a way of playing, and you only copy things to get started, and then you wait for those moments, and each time you're playing, it's one of those moments, and that's what's so great about jazz and life. There is no formula, and all we see on television is, you can be beautiful, rich, attractive, and groovy if you buy this. And then they have a disclaimer saying it might give you cancer, a heart attack, or die, but that's cool because you want to be hip. Well, actually, Charles Parker, way before uh, Huey Lewis wrote the, uh, the thing about the hippest thing to be a square, Charlie Parker told me that in 1952 when he visited, he said, man, the hippest thing is to be a square. And he meant by that those old-fashioned virtues, practice, work hard, be humble, be interested, be gracious. That's the key. So now I'm making comeback number 642,000 on the horn because I get so many, I get more calls now than I did when I was playing all the time because now there's some many people using horns. And I have a list of about 65 horn players I recommend <laughs> if they want someone to sit down, piece, pick up a piece of paper and play the heck out of it on the first take. But I still improvise and play with my group and I love to do that. And the blessings of a world that I would have never been in if I wasn't doing that enabled me to come down to Cuba in 77 and meet you and work with you with symphonies and do all the stuff that we've done. And playing jazz makes you a better conductor, a better composer, and a better person. 
the improvisation is uh, but it's, it's still it's still today it's not too many people uh, that improvise on that instrument but maybe maybe it's because it's a, a intimidating uh, instrument technically oh, you, yeah. you, don't, you don't think so because it's a hard instrument all the all the harmonics oh. are, are such an, an a high part of the horn yeah they, they say well they, they used to say this many, many times that the, the the horn the French horn it God's horn because you blow it in one end and only God knows what's going out in the, in the <laughs> Well, I remember the magnificent video you made when you were showing the clarinet, and you make it sound so easy. And I was shocked some of the horn, when I was playing at the Cornelius Street, some of the horn players in the New York Philharmonic came down, and they enjoyed what I was doing. I was embarrassed. They were like such staggeringly good players. But sometimes you can accept the limitations of the instrument and your own limitations and play within that. Bobby Hackett's famous thing was when they sold his trumpet, they said, Bobby Hackett's trumpet, perfect condition, magnificent action, great original. They said, and the upper register, 100% perfect because it's never been used. And Bobby Hackett could play up there and Chet Baker could play up there, but they figured if they weren't playing up there, they could do something else of themselves. But when you hear Dizzy play up there or John Faddis or other people, it's oh, magnificent. And Freddie Hubbard, they could play, and Winton, they play all over the instrument, and it all sounds good. And there are French horn players like that too now who use the lower part of the instrument and the high part, and they got the, and I've been at these horn conventions, and they have some younger people coming up mm. who can play what they used to call legit horn magnificently, and they can play improvising music and they're interested. So the job of us older folks, since I'll be 90 next month as we speak, is wow. to try to show the soulful part and the human part and the humbling part, which is we're here for the music. And if you play Latin music in cajunto, to be together, say it in cajunto man is that's important for every music and once you do that then you get interested in the music and you remember lester young's famous story when someone said prez i want to play for you and he played he played 68 million notes almost broke the plaster in the building and played box greatest hits arnold schoenberg's outtakes the flight of the bumblebee and giant steps four times faster than john coltrane's Olympic record, Prez being this super gentleman, said, that was most impressive. Now, I'd like to hear your story. And that's the whole thing in music. And once you realize that, then you can spend the rest of your life trying to get better and appreciating everybody else and what they do. And, and you know that, and you personify that, and God bless you for that. And I'm trying to be that way myself. I'm that, trying to catch that, up to you. That's that's important. Yeah, yeah, to know what other people have to say. That's why I will tell you this opportunity to ask you: How was your uh, work with Charles Mingus? How how do you how did he find about you? And uh, who was the rest of the band with, with Mingus? Because I understand that he was a very uh, unique person like moon <laughs> unique personality right <laughs> oh man he was amazing and he was really full-time composer and he originally wanted to play with the symphony and because of the racism of that time he was told as a kid man that's impossible so he figured well boy he could really play play the bass so he started off and found his own way to play. And in 1955, I came back from, I was in the army in Europe. And when I was playing at a bar in Munich, I met Leonard Feather, who was a wonderful critic. And he wrote me up and down, he said, there's some kid in the army really playing jazz on the French horn. 
et cetera, et cetera. I was knocked out because I was there. I was a 23-year-old soldier with zero expectations of anything except hoping to get out of the army without going to the stockade. So I was just so happy. Then he said, when you get to New York, if you ever come, give me a call. So I came back to go to Manhattan School of Music. And sure enough, I called up Leonard Feather. And instead of hanging up the phone, cursing, which I experienced many times when I first got there, he was gracious. He said, oh, yes. He said, come on, I'm having a big party. And at the party was Dick Hyman. Wow. I, I, and Billy Holiday was there. All the O.C. Johnson, all these like incredible musicians. I, I was like in heaven. And he said, look, David, he said, I'm going to go down and hear Bud Powell's trio at Birdland. You want to come? I said, wow, I'd love to hear it. Bud in person. So I went there. He had a bass player that was standing in front of him, way in front, about 10 feet, almost in the audience, giving directions to Bud and the drummer and playing his can off. I said, I've never seen any bass player like that. I said, Leonard, who's that guy? He said, oh, that's Charles Mingus. I said, oh, I've heard Mingus fingers. I never knew that there was an actual person. So he came over to the table because Leonard at that time was a supporter of all those musicians that every other critic said were playing wrong and appreciated. So Leonard said, Mingus, this new kid in town it's named Dave Amram, he's a real good jazz French horn player. Mingus gave me a very deep look and said, you go on the road with me for $125 a week. I think if I said yes, he would have, he would have punched me in the mouth. But I said, I said, Mr. Mingus, I'm honored, but I'm going to Manhattan School of Music. I have the GI Bill and I'm studying French horn and I'm studying composition. And he said, you'll learn more with me than you ever will in school. So I drove with him and George Barrow. And he said, you're all right. So there I was my third week in New York as a member of the Charles Mingus Quintet in heaven. And I met, that's where I met Thelonious Monk and Miles and Oscar Pettiford and all these people that still, and this is quite a few weeks later, 1955, that was like 65 years ago, every day of my life I realized how lucky I was and if they even bothered to talk to me, then I had an obligation if I was lucky enough to be, live long enough to become an older person to try to do the same thing to anybody and everybody that crossed my path. And Mingus was kind of a, he had, he had a bipolar situation at that time. And one time he was cursing at me. <laughs> I was playing, you know, I was playing along. Bam, he hit me with his elbow, said, no more to me in two courses. So being 20, then I was just about to turn 25. I, I said, and I bought been the gym teacher in box. I said, Mingus, we got to go outside. He said, what? And I said, yes, sir. I said, he said, well, what do you want? I said, man, we got to fight. He said, what? I knew he would kill me. I said, well, I know I can hit you once before you knock me down. He said, man, you're all right. He put his arm on my shoulder, went back into the Bohemia and said, buy this cat a drink. He wanted to fight with me. So after that, <laughs> we were really friends for life. But he was the kind of guy, if you said, Mingus, I love your playing, he might punch you out. He, he didn't suffer fools lightly and he didn't like compliments and he didn't, he was like direct honesty and he was that way himself. And then fortunately he found some medicine in 1969. I was sitting someplace and somebody put their hands over my eyes from behind and said, guess who? I said, Mingus, I know your voice anywhere in all my life. He said, I'm cool. I said, what happened? He said, I went to Bellevue and he said, they got this thing called a computer and they figured out what I needed. And they found some medicine that actually helped him just to cool out. And then he got Lou Gehrig's disease and passed away. But I remember hearing a string quartet at the Whitney Museum. He was an amazing composer, amazing musician, and a 
beautiful person. He just got angry and couldn't control it sometimes. But beside that, he had a beautiful side. And boy, could he play the piano like Dizzy and everyone else could. But, but he was, Dizzy was, as you know from working with him, was phenomenal. One time he was playing, and I said, God, Dizzy, your voicings. He said, I'm a harmony freak. Well, Mingus didn't call himself a harmony freak, but he would say, well, here's all the things you are. Here's how Duke Ellington would have played it here. And he would go down the whole history of jazz showing different ways of playing a song. And he said, you got to find your way. And when I was working with symphonies more and more and composing, he appreciated my efforts. And he knew I appreciated his efforts. And we had a respect, mutual respect for each other. And I think it was very difficult for him as a terrific composer and pioneer to spend his whole life working in bar rooms. And that's what it was like. Great, amazing music and the recordings are there to prove it of guys who gave so much to our culture and received so little in return. So he was one of our saints, like so many of the great jazz artists, and like Bela Bartok, the composer who had to teach piano lessons and almost starved to death. A lot of great, great people did not get their, what they deserved during their lifetime, but they left us a gift that will be here forever. Well, that, that happened with so many other artists. Uh, uh, I remember a story that uh, Billy, Billy Strangford, he was supposed to be a classical soloist, a classical pianist, and, and he received so many uh, uh, opinions that who, you, you are black, you are not supposed to be a, a, a concert pianist. And then he, he became, thanks to Duke, Duke Ellington, he became uh, one of the greatest uh, uh, songwriters ever. You know? Oh, incredible. Yeah, yeah. R and Don Shirley, whom I worked with, they made that movie, The Green Book, I think it was called. And I, I remember doing Rhapsody in Blue with him. And he said, David, he said, you've known each other a long time and you've come played, you know, sat with my group and you've heard us play and we're friends. He said, now we're going to be at the Charles Ives Center. He said, since you're going to conduct, he said, I want to do Rhapsody in Blue my way. And I think it's what Gershwin had in mind. I said, Don, the gig of the conductor is to help out, not to come in and wreck it. So whatever you do, just let me know. We'll go over it and I'll try to help out. And then when everybody's playing, stay out of the way and let it happen. So you, and, you were talking about Billy Strayhorn? No, no, this, this was Don Shirley, who was in the same situation. He was a great classic. Oh, oh, another, yeah. yeah. Well, Billy, Billy Strayhorn, the famous story was when Duke was told that this amazing guy that wrote Lush Life when he was 15 years old, and, and Duke always would help out anybody and be interested and at least say hello and listen and encourage. So they said, well, how did you like the show? And he said, well, Mr. Ellington, I think the way you would have played it if you had done the same thing that you did when you were in Pittsburgh a few years ago. And then he sat down at the piano and said, here's what, here's what the band played. Here's the way you played it a few years ago. And I think this is what you should do now. <laughs> and Duke sat there and he said, get that guy a plane ticket. I want to have him work with me tomorrow. And that was it. Billy Strayhorn was magnificent. Yeah, but well, that that uh, thanks to Duke Ellington that he uh, exposed the beautiful talent of, of uh, Billy Strayhorn. Uh, and that's the extraordinary thing about about jazz that this magnificent music, and when you go to different countries around the world where they hate us, after some jazz musicians show up and play, they love us. <laughs> because the music is so beautiful, it transcends all the other stuff totally. And when you when you figure that the people who created that were treated worse at the at the ASPCA for the younger folks, that's the association of people that love dogs and animals. If they treated an animal 
way most of the jazz geniuses and most people of color were treated and still are today to a, to an extent there would there would have been a national riot but in spite of that in spite of that this magnificent music was and is and always will be created and i say that because no one gets uptight if you say Beethoven was German or Beethoven was white. So what? We Everybody accepts that because that's in the pure culture book. So I don't see why anybody should be upset if they say that it's an African-American art form and a lot of us that were lucky enough to be part of that made our little contribution. Conversely, you when we had the Brooklyn Philharmonic and we had people of color play, it wasn't because we had a quota or I went slumming or thought I was doing anybody a favor or being mighty whitey. It's just, I knew a lot of people that could play up a storm and keep everything together and help me and the music out. Wilmer Wise was our first trumpet player. And I remember in 1978, 79, when I first started the contractor said, well, you're allowed to have your two choices. This Wilmer Wise, can he read music? I said, yes, he plays with Pablo Casal in the Marlboro Music Festival. And they're generally, they're not jamming <laughs> on the chord changes. They actually have parts that Mozart, Beethoven wrote. And if the trumpet player can't cut it, there's 700 other people that would love to have the gig. I said, he's a monster, great player. And I said to the contractor, I know if I mess up, he'll get me out of it because he can really play. And sure enough, the first five years, he really was a huge help, not only you'll saving remember. the day and saving my music, but giving me a subtle hint like, Dave, you're very creative, but where's the one? <laughs> <laughs> Give where's us the, the one. one. <laughs> or don't flop around so much. You know, once we got it, let it happen. You know, a lot of little things that you can be told by great musicians if they know you want to do a better job conducting. And of course, and, and band leaders, the same thing. You're, you set up that feeling and you make everybody else feel good about themselves. And then they forget about you and forget about themselves and the music takes over. Yeah, That's what we all go for the important things is, is the music, not 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 the person. It's the music what is important. Do you remember when we play the uh, the Weber Concerto? Oh my the gosh! Symphony, and one of the bass players was Ron Carter. You don't yeah. remember that? <laughs> I think I have the pictures around. <laughs> It was in Brooklyn in the in the uh, in the shell out of, out of doors for a Prospect Park, right? In the right. Prospect Park, and it was so very so, surprised because I I said I said David that guy back there in the contrabass section he looked exactly like Ron Carter, and you told me he's Ron Carter. It is him. <laughs> no kidding. I want to. That was the way I I met Ron Carter playing wow. in the Brooklyn Symphony. <laughs> <laughs> so, so many beautiful things happened to me uh, playing with you, David. You, you gave me one of my first gigs in New York City in a place called Jazzmania. Oh, my Lord. I remember that. 
Remember that? Uh, the, uh, the Mike Morgenstern, he would give a big speech and say, we got the best bagels in town with more cream cheese and it's only a dollar 25. And then he would sit it on the bass clarinet. No, no, uh, hey, the contra bass clarinet. Yeah. He play the contra bass in, <laughs> clarinet in B flat. No, yeah. in B flat, big one. He yeah. was very tall, like, like a giant. Uh, actually, uh, Victor Vanega, the bass player, used to call him the, the giraffe. <laughs> <laughs> Victor Vanega, what a great guy, the uh, contra bass player. Yeah, he, we were in, in the army together. Victor was an incredible. And, yeah. and he was one of those guys who could play jazz really well and Latin music really oh, yeah. well and knew all the stuff. And I was just lucky. And then Mayra Casales played with us, the wonderful Cunguera, from whose folks came from Cuba. and. She came over, lived in Miami. She said, time is my friend. And she could play up a storm. And Steve Berrios, oh my Lord. He was like my, another one of my gurus. I, aside from playing with him, I hung out. And he showed me so much stuff. And all the guys, Andy Gonzalez. And, and Ray, Ray, Monti, Ray Monti, I was in the band too. Yeah. And he said, man, the clave he said, I don't want to be a slave of that. I'm trying to get out. And he was, he was so creative, but he said, I want, I want to write a concerto. He signed me. He said, this way it goes. I said, Ray, you got the whole piece in your head. He said, yeah, but I can't write it out. I said, man, you should get down and do that because you could do that better than anybody. And then you can go over it 200 times to make sure that it feels natural. And he, he was a very musical. And I remember I was telling your, your, your friend who works with you, when when we got off the boat and I at that point my Spanglish was quite limited to put it mildly, and <laughs> and and Ray started talking to me. You told me years later, man, I couldn't understand anything he was saying because he had that, that you, New York style. You know why? Um, when I met uh, Ray Mantilla, well, he came in that boat. I, yeah, with you and Dizzy and Air Father Hines was there too, and Stan Getz. And uh, I saw this guy and I approached him because I heard him saying some words in English, I mean in Spanish. And then he started talking to me and was the first time in my life I heard somebody speaking in Spanglish. <laughs> and I have no idea because it was, it was a mix of English and Spanish, but was 50-50. <laughs> I said, yeah, man, my name is, is Ray Mantilla, yo toco la tumbadora. A veces toco con David, and another times I go with everybody in New York, and todo el mundo me conoce a mí allá. What? Let <laughs> me tell you, I don't know what he's talking about. It's, it's <laughs> a very strange language. But he was a great guy, huh? Oh, the best. I remember one time I said, Ray, it's incredible. Ahora tengo un concierto en inglés y español para la, la joven y gente en Denver, Colorado. I said, Ray, you're not going to believe it, man. I'm giving you a concert in English and, Sp and Spanish in Denver, Colorado for young people. He said, man, he said, your Spanish is cool, but how them kids going to understand your English with that New York accent? So it made me realize, you know, that all languages are relative and they're all correct. And if a million people speak Spanish in a certain way, and they speak it, and a million people speak it differently in a different way, and they don't speak Castellano. That's cool too, because that yeah. means each way describes a heritage, a legacy, a history that's unique, that shows that's how people were brought up, that's what they heard as children, that's how they are. And it's the same thing with music. There are so many different ways to play something. And if it's from the heart and it's sincere, it's always correct. Yes, and uh, uh, David was a very original human being and, and very original player. And uh, uh, David, uh, I never had the chance to tell you that me and, and my family, we all love you because you have a, such a human approach to music. And I have to, to tell everybody that uh, 
David Dunran gave me one of my first gigs in New York and was the first time that I played in a jazz group with a great French horn player. <laughs> the jazz French horn player, that, that is something unique. I mean that David Dunran is a totally unique and original musician, an original artist. Very few artists I have had the chance to play that I enjoy so much uh, originality and creativeness. Thank you, David Dana, to be with us here. We all love you, and I hope that very soon we play some music together again. Me too, yo también, and for all your friends and for your family and for all the listeners and all the young people that are watching you that adore you too, I could just say practice, work, don't get discouraged when you're told there's no demographics proving that there's a market for jazz, symphony, acting, theater, poetry. That's fine. Respect their sage advice. Hang out with somebody else and you can tell them, remind them, there's never too many sunsets and never enough beauty. Thank you, David Downer. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you, Dave. <laughs> Hasta pronto. I love to Brenda. Hasta pronto, hermano. <laughs> Okay, you cannot talk about contemporary jazz horn players without mentioning the name of the great Chris Comer. Chris mm -hmm. is the, the uh, principal hornist of the uh, New Jersey Symphony, a wonderful orchestra. But I, I have to tell you how did I find this guy. Uh, now you can find anything in, in YouTube. So uh, I found Chris Comer, you know. And then the first thing that I, I find is a guy with a French horn, with a French horn, playing giant steps. You are not supposed to play that in, in any instrument. And then find Chris coming by playing that with the French horn beautifully. Welcome, Chris. We are so happy Thank to be part of this uh, celebration of the French ah. horn. <laughs> nice to be here. Thanks for asking me to do it. Well, uh, uh, tell, tell, tell us something. How was the French horn your first instrument? Uh, no, I started on trumpet. Uh, oh, and then uh, in sixth grade, I picked up the horn, but I kept playing the trumpet in the jazz ensemble. And in, in high school, I actually played the trombone in the jazz ensemble. Oh. And in college, my horn teacher thought I should not do that anymore. So I, I stopped playing the trumpet and trombone, but I played, I started playing piano more in, in college and in, in um, at Wichita State. We had a very good jazz program at Wichita State. In fact, my roommate was Matt Wilson, a great drummer, Matt Wilson. Oh, and, uh, yeah. And, and he, um, he and I played in the same rhythm section in the, in the second big band at Wichita State. So I, I was started doing more piano and I got to New York. I wanted to try to do more piano, but I realized that New York had about 10,000 really good jazz pianists <laughs> and uh, only a handful of people who were playing jazz on the French horn. So I really decided then that I wanted to do more of it on the French horn and try to carve a little niche for myself in the big apple that way. And uh, after many, many years of, you know, shedding and playing with Abersol CDs, cause no one was asking me to come to a session. Um, I feel like it's finally starting to pay off. I get to play with um, people like you, Paquito and, uh, Tour, touring with uh, Jamie Baum Septet Plus and uh, some other really great jazz groups in New York. So I feel like it finally, you know, after all these years, it's starting to, uh, it's starting to really pay off. I mean, I still do a lot of classical, uh, as you know, with the New Jersey Symphony. Um, 
and other other groups and chamber groups and uh, whatnot. But I, I I feel like I still I'm doing enough jazz on the horn to feel almost like a jazz musician. So. That's... <laughs> well, I think you have almost the same beginning, like uh, who is a pioneer in this uh, jazz horn playing, which is Julius Watkins. He used right. to. He, he started with the trump. I, I was reading that he started with the trumpet. Mm -hmm. So the, it's, yep. it's, it's the feeling. It, it's like I, I remember David Sanborn saying, saying, saying once, my my uh, biggest influence are are uh, guitar players, you know, rock and roll mm -hmm. guitar players because he he got that rock and roll style, and then. I, th I think I, I hear even St. Julius Joaquin that uh, he feels inspired by, by uh, Clifford Brown. So the, sure. the, let's, let's say you used to listen to, not to saxophone players, but to singers. You know, this, this, I, I feel that the, in the way you play the horn, I feel that you have that, that trumpet feeling. I am, am I right? Well, I, I ended up listening to a lot of tenor saxophonists, uh -huh. you know, um, and, and, and of course, pianists. So, um, you know, but, but I, you know, obviously listened to a lot of trumpet players and even trombone players. But I, I felt like the, the tenor saxophone was the voice that kind of resonated more with, with me on, on the French horn. Um, of course, it's impossible to play the... The complicated lines that they play, but just the melodic sense uh, of you know people like Coltrane and, and Michael Brecker and Sonny Rollins, those guys really influenced my melodic sense. I think. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's interesting how the the instrument like intimidates the people, especially to Im improvise. I know that very few of uh, or people like you around the French, the first uh, French horn, just French hornist that I play was the the ineffable David Amram. Did, did sure. you ever play with him? I, I haven't ever played with him. I've met David. Uh, I love his music. I love his uh, his improv with his rap. I mean, he was like the first rap guy. I mean, <laughs> doing it before anybody, and and all his whistles and he plays so many different instruments it's so inspiring to, to watch him perform and uh you know he still plays the horn you know he's still playing yes um, it's great no i i definitely um influenced and inspired by david i i've only met him once i doubt he'll even remember me or, or know my name but i have i have met i have met david He's a very fine uh, a classical conductor, symphony conductor. I played with him once, uh, in, once in a while. And I, I met him in Cuba. Oh, wow. He went there in a, a, on a jazz cruise called the, the, uh, the, the Daphne. Stan Guest was there and, and, and uh, Stan Guest, D.C. Gillespie, uh, Air Father Heinz. So it was a surprise wow. because there was nothing in the... In the uh, in the newspaper or anything. And and then I saw this guy with all those whistles and all those, those colors and and then he pulled out the French horn. And said, a French horn? What are you playing with that? Uh -huh. I, I used to play with Charles Mingus. I said, no kidding. Yeah, and then he started playing. And what a beautiful instrument, but it, it, it uh, well, uh, I, I knew all the Mozart concertos and of course, the the, uh, the uh, Strauss concertos, uh, two or three of them, and uh, two. two two concertos. His father was a French horn player, right? Well, right, three. If you if you count Franz Strauss, there's more than two. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, and then uh, playing swing with that instrument was a. Uh, it looked like the the, dif the difficulty of the instrument intimidates other people. To, to use it to improvise, right? They, they well, don't know what they are doing. I, I, I really think that the main obstacle is we French horn players, unless you're playing another instrument, 
when we were in school growing up as a kid, we just don't get to play even in the jazz band. So we're not around it. We're really outside of the, outside of the box. So, yeah, like I said, like you said, the only way I kind of got into it was I kept playing the trumpet and the trombone and it's still, I was still doing it, but it's just hard as a kid, if you're not playing in the jazz groups to, to get really into it. I don't think it's the horn as much as it's just not an instrument in the big band, you know, as much. Uh, I actually think it's easier to improvise on the French horn than the trombone. Mm -hmm. I mean, the trombone, you, you've got to negotiate the seven slide position, the horn, you know, it's all right there. So I actually mm -hmm. think it's easier, but there's, you know, thousands of great jazz trombone players and not hardly any jazz French hornets just because of just this social thing of not playing in, in the big bands when, you, when you're growing up. It's unfortunate. I mean, some big band writers write a couple of horn parts. So, you know, every now and then they would call you in to play one French horn part in, in a big band chart, but it's, it's very rare. Um, one, one of the guys that does write for horns in the big band is uh, Gary Morgan, who is one of the other composers uh, I picked to, to write th this four movement uh, jazz horn concerto. Uh, Gary wrote, always wrote for two horns in his big band. It's a 20 piece, uh, mostly Latin Brazilian music, but the, the French horn um, was an important sound that he wanted in the big band. And he, he got the sound in his head by playing with uh, Rob McConnell's Boss Brass big band in, in Toronto, which had two French horns in it. That's another big band writer that always had two horns in the band to fill out that that brass sound give it a little bit more of a more of a middle range and a you know just give it a little bit more fuller fuller texture uh and gary gary played uh barry saxophone in that band with with rob mcconnell so that's where he got the two horns in his head but it's still very rare uh, of course stan ketten had had the kind of the bell front uh mellophone type yeah uh and a few others you know uh of course the first video i saw of julius watkins was with the quincy jones big band playing french horn with the quincy jones big band when quincy was running a, a, and touring with his his big band uh so quincy had a had the horn in there but it's still it's still pretty rare among I mean, even the Village Vanguard Orchestra used to have a horn chair. I don't know if you knew that, Pucky. Oh, I don't remember that. Yeah, they used to have a horn chair in the Village Vanguard. And then, Did for whatever play? reason, Did I never play? played it. The chair was already gone by the time I got to New York. They didn't have any. So they stopped. Who, uh, who, played, who played the French horn there? With, with the, with the well, uh, it was girl named Stephanie Farber and Peter Wright used to play there, sub there. I mean, uh, at the end, I don't think they really had a regular member. They were just trying to get whoever was available on, on Monday nights um, mm -hmm. to come down and play. And I, I think they just got frustrated. They felt like they couldn't get the chair covered really well every week. So they, they kind of uh, let it go. But I keep bugging those guys. I say, you got to Bring back the horn chair in the Vanguard Orchestra. I, I'd love to do it. Not, not, too, not too many horn players around, so uh, probably they, they will have a, 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 a part transcribed for a trombone or to another saxophone or something. May, may, maybe yeah. John Clark. Maybe John Clark played in the, in the band for a I while. I think he did it. I think he did it some. Yeah, definitely. I think John did it. That, that's that's yeah. another one. That's another rarity. John John Clark, you know. Yeah, John's friend of mine. Yeah, yeah. wonderful play and a very funny cat. Yeah. What uh, one day you should get together and do a when you know a, a five five horn band or something because the, the sound of the instrument and people that can swing with the instrument is is rare. It's it's, it's not very common. Yeah, it's. 
it's hard to get everybody together. You know, I'm in Montana. You know, I'm saying. <laughs> but you live there? Are you now? You are living there? No, or? oh no, no. I just come out here in the summertime. I, uh, I still live in New York City, and and um, l luckily the New Jersey Symphony doesn't have a summer season, which allows me to come out here in the summertime. But uh, uh, no, I'm just here in the summer. I, maybe someday. Someday I might move out here more full time. Yeah. So uh, I think I, we, I want to talk about how happy I was when I received a call from the New Jersey Symphony for me to write a piece for Chris Comer. For Chris Comer, the orchestra that I, I love very much and the rhythm section together with another uh, three composers, I believe. And right. uh, uh, for some, I, I uh, for some reason I I heard that they, they uh, were going to mix all this with the names of painters and all that. What is the whole idea? And who are the other composers that are going to be part of this wonderful project? Uh, sure. French sure. Morris, um, Freedom Session and Symphony Orchestra. Yeah. Um, well, I somehow managed to convince the management to commission a, a, a jazz horn concerto for me to play with the New Jersey Symphony, which I don't think has ever happened before with, uh, no. with a full orchestra, you know? So um, anyway, they, they let me, you know, basically pick the composers I wanted to. And I, I worked Paquito, uh, with you with the win, Aspen Wing Quintet when you wrote uh, the Aristopicales, the, 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 all the dances for the Aspen. That's when I met you way back. And I loved your writing. And um, I, I thought it would be uh, perfect to have a little bit of, you know, the Cuban Latin feel uh, with your movement, which would happen no matter what, you know. And the other uh, three composers are, are Christian McBride, uh, who I love his, his big band writing is great. And I, I, I thought it might be fun for him to write for full orchestra. I'm not sure he has ever written for full orchestra, but uh, um, I, I love his writing. And Gary Morgan, of course, is a great big band writer that I've been playing in his band for 25 years in New York and uh, he's just a close friend of mine and I, I really love his harmonic sense and uh, so he was uh, easy choice. Uh, Vivian Lee is a very young composer who lives in London. She, um, she plays bluegrass and she plays gypsy jazz and she plays mandolin in these groups. Um, but has been writing lots of really great music, chamber music. She wrote me a, a horn trio for piano, horn, and violin, which is kind of jazzy too. It has some improv sections in it. Uh, and I loved it so much. I, I thought that she would be uh, a good choice to write a piece for full orchestra. And, and she has written for full orchestra, but um, it, this was also a challenge for her to, to do as well. Um, so that's how the, I picked the composers, and uh, we, as far as I know, we're still slated to perform in January, but I have a feeling that it's going to get delayed for some reason. Uh, I don't know when. It'll happen. I'm just not sure when, when they'll, uh, it'll eventually. I, they haven't officially canceled it. Oh, sorry about the wind. Oh, okay. uh, not facing now. It's not affecting the microphone. Okay. No. no. Um, they haven't officially canceled. It's the third week of January, 2021. But I, I just have this feeling that it's probably going to get delayed. Is well, that your feeling, Paquita? Have they told you anything about that? No, no, no. Everything is no. on hold. Nobody knows what's going to happen with this uh, uh, pandemia thing. But. Yeah. Uh, I, I hope soon this uh, this coronavirus be, become become a corona beer or something, because <laughs> it's, it's terrible. But I hope we can play that because I I have to tell you that I play I I wrote this piece with so much so much love, 
And uh, who's going to be the conductor? Is the, the uh, you, you know who Shin. the conductor? Shin, oh, our, our, our music oh, director. I yeah, know. she's great. Oh, fantastic. I, I saw her, she was conducting, I don't remember. I was invited by uh, David Gould, who played the bass clarinet there. Oh yeah, David, sure, yeah. And then I, I went I went to see her do conducting. The, uh, I don't remember it, it was, uh, it was a piano concerto. Uh, I don't. I remember you were Chostakovich. It was a, one of those heavy composers. It was a Chostakovich or, or or Prokofiev something. And and I was so impressed by the way that that she worked the orchestra, and it, it looked like the the orchestra is very very uh, happy to work with that uh, conductor. She's, oh, oh, we love her. We love absolutely love her. She's yeah. fan phenomenal. She's phenomenal. She well, was actually. She was nervous about doing the jazz horn concerto because she hasn't done a lot of jazz, but her time is so good. She's got impeccable time that I was like, you, she will have no problem with this. Don't be nervous. So I'm glad she's decided to, to conduct it. So I think she has a great, a great sense of, of rhythm and all that. That is, in this world, is important to keep. They they are open to the uh, to the rhythm. Do you know who are, who is the rhythm section already? You know who they are. Well, I I know who I want. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I hope that the you know that they they've been delayed getting their their contracts too because they don't know exactly when it's going to happen. So, but the the guys I I want are really really young guys that I've been listening to in New York City for a while that I really love. Um, the, their names are uh, Diallo House on bass, Ishmael Laval on drums. Both those guys play with Stacy Dillard's trio, Brooklyn Circle. Uh, you can hear them at Smalls. Uh, well, you could have. You used to be able to hear them at Smalls all the time. Uh, usually one of the late later sets. Um, Pianist is a guy named Reggie Berg, who's a brilliant composer himself, a uh, great classical pianist, but an incredible jazz pianist, too. Um, I worked with him on the, the horn trio uh, that Vivian wrote, um, and I was just really impressed with both his meticulous classical uh, abilities and his incredible jazz improv. So he can do it all, and uh, I know Vivian's you don't be afraid to write hard piano parts because he can play anything. So th this guy, I hope that we can we can get these guys to play. So that's that's still the plan, I think, is for those guys. Oh, very good. It's 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 good to have that kind of uh, of, of musician handy people that can uh, uh, assimilate different styles of music because like like the great the great Duke Ellington say there is there is only two kind of music. Good music yeah. and the other stuff, you know. So yeah. it's great. Well, we have to mention that I I, I get too nervous that, that they they uh, delay you no know, the pan the pandemic uh, situation, delay the the uh, the premiere of the piece, and I I could not wait to hear Chris playing the, his uh, wonderful horn, and I wrote a reduction of the piece. Uh, a reduction yeah. for the, the rhythm section and a couple of I, I play a little bit the clarinet too and uh, we want to to uh, present this to you guys it's a it's a reduction of the of the entire my, my section of the piece the, the movement and the it's interesting because my favorite my favorite p uh, painter is Salvador Dali the Catalonian painter and Mine then, too. Mine too. Know, what a coincidence that, huh? Well, well that's, that's the thread. I, I couldn't think of a thread to tie all the different composers together. And I thought, well, one thread could be uh, in, inspiration from the painter Dali. Just any kind of inspiration at all, you know, whether it's a feeling or uh, an idea from the, from the imagery and, and you know the the story behind the painting whatever but uh 
it's a loose thread, but I think it's, since I really like Dali's paintings, I, I've admired him forever. I thought, well, why not? I, I think it's at least some connection between uh, between the movements, so. Oh, that, that's great. Uh, and then I feel inspired for this, uh, for this little video that we prepared. Uh, to, I find the power to call a friend of mine who, who is a great painter. His, his name is uh, uh, Omar Corrales. And uh, um, I call the piece, I mean, my, 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 uh, my movement, uh, uh, Dali in the tropics. You know, I can imagine yeah. Dali painting in the tropics, in, I don't know, in Brazil or, or in Cuba or one of those places. And he did this for us. He painted this. <laughs> Isn't that great? Oh, wow. Oh, that <laughs> is great. He like Salvador, Salvador Dali painting wow. paint the jungle. On the and, on the <laughs> and he's wow. painting three uh, bata drums. And there is a Jesus Christ of of uh, of there, and there is four women dancing. You will see. Wow! Yeah, I can't wait to see it close up. Wow, that's really cool. It is, it is included in the, in the video that we did. And, oh uh, yeah, that's right. Okay, that's what I saw before. Yeah. Yeah. Great. The job, right? I then, love the video. I love that video. It's brilliant. The video cool. is wonderful. Is it was uh, they put to. Uh, Juanito, uh, Juan Ruiz, and, and Diana Alvarez, they, we are uh, two clarinet players that uh, help me on this work. They put together this, this wonderful video uh, of, of the pre, it's a preview of Dali in the tropics, dedicated to the one and only Chris Comer, ah. one, one of the greatest uh, home players ever. So I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much, Chris, to be here with us, and I hope to see you in uh, with with the whole orchestra in January. Yeah, I do too. I do too. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks again for having me, Paquito. It's it's all, it's been a pleasure the whole the whole process. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Enjoy. Ali. All right. Bye.